All right, if you'll take your Bibles and prepare to turn all over the place with me today, <laughs> because we've got a long, uh, a lot to, a lot to cover. We've been talking about the resurrection and um, all the little details about the resurrection. Now we want to talk about a lot of different prophecies about the future, but really we're starting with the resurrection. And so far we've dealt with the reality of the resurrection, which was, we, we really just spent the whole week on 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul makes the argument that the resur- of course we're going to be resurrected after we die because Jesus rose from the dead. We, we can be confident in the resurrection because Jesus already rose from the dead, and we can prove that. And Paul, and Paul goes on to list a bunch of eyewitnesses who saw him after he died. And he says, since we can prove that Jesus rose from the dead, of course we should expect to also experience the resurrection. And Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, he says. So then we talked about, okay, since the resurrection is real and we will rise again, the next question that came is what happens to us between when we die and when we rise again? Right? What happens to our soul in that period of time? We talked about the concept that some people have come up with, a soul sleep, where you just sort of go to sleep and go into a state of non-existence until you rise. And I think we showed pretty, pretty clearly that that's not the biblical um, view of where the, what happens to the soul. No, the soul goes somewhere and does something until it's raised at some point. So then the question becomes, well, do all souls go to the same place, or, or what happens? Is there a division between souls? And that was uh, last week. We talked about the first resurrection and the second resurrection, and how the uh, first resurrection, the second resurrection is never really called the second resurrection. <laughs> in, in Revelation, the first resurrection is called the first resurrection, and this is when uh, believers in Christ are raised and uh, they are judged uh, according to the judgment seat of Christ. They are given rewards, and they live forever with Christ. And then Revelation talks about, instead of the second resurrection, it says the second death. And when Jesus spoke about these two resurrections, he says there's a resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto death, saying that those who are not believers, or actually those who, who do not have their name written in the book of life, um, end up being resurrected as well as believers are, but they're not resurrected for heaven. They're resurrected instead for uh, eternal conscious torment. <laughs> and actually, that segues into what we're talking about today. It's what is hell? What is it like? What is, what is it exactly? Because people will argue over whether it's actual literal, whether hell is actually a literal place or just sort of a figurative place. Is there really torment in hell, or is it, you know, just sort of a figurative thing? Is there really fire in hell? Um, what is hell about? Now, hell is not the subject that we want, <laughs> that we really want to study, right? As a matter of fact, I love the idea that hell doesn't exist. I would, I that just would please me so much. If 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 you stop and close your eyes for a second and imagine that there is no hell, and that pleases you then I think that you're a normal human being, right? I mean, this, this, yeah, obviously we would want there to be no hell. But the question is not what, what do we want there to be. The question is what, what's the truth, right? And, and we don't want our, our doctrine to revolve around what would be nice if it was true, right? The question is what is actually true? And so there's, this, is, this is the challenge that people will bring up. They'll say that, Hell is not eternal, or that it's not actual consci- consciousness, or that it's not actually torment. Uh, and so the, the idea that we want to deal with today is, is hell eternal, conscious, and tormentous? Right? Is, it, is there eternal, conscious torment in hell? And um, so we're going to talk about each of those things. The arguments really that, that come against this from Scripture are going to say, well, no, the, the Bible says it's a second death, which means death is just going into non-existence, and when, we're, when a soul goes to hell, it's burned up, it's consumed, and then it's gone, right? Um, so we want, to, we want to ask if that's the case. So let's talk a little bit about, well, let's talk about hell, okay? 
What, what, is the, uh, what does the Bible say about it? And where, does, uh, where do we fall on it? Okay, so there's, let's, start with, uh, let's start with this. What are the words used for hell in the scripture? Okay, there are five different ways that hell is referred in scripture. Now, we just pretty much have them all translated in English as hell. But in the scripture, it's actually very different, okay? There's one word that is only used one time for hell. That is the word tartaru. Tartaru. That is in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, says that the angels that um, rebelled against God are held in chains in a place called tartaru. Um, and, of course, it's translated in our, our Bible as hell. Um, verse 4 of Second Peter 2, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, or Tartaru, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, this word is this is the only time the word is used in all of the Bible, this word Tartaru. Um, so it basically means a place of judgment for those who are damned. Now, this is important to know that the purpose for hell for hell is for the angels like god didn't create the world and create hell and say hey that's where i want to send people right god created the world and created hell to judge the angels who rebelled against him right so this is this is important tartaru just means a place of judgment for the damned and it's only used one time but uh the words that are more commonly used in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is sheol, which just means the afterlife. It could be talking, someone who is a, a believer in Christ might be said in the Old Testament to go to sheol, and it just means the grave. It just means they're going to die and go to whatever is after that, right? And then someone who is um, an, an unbeliever might go, um, the, remember, as the sons of Korah, they rebelled against Moses, and the ground opened up and swallowed them. And, uh, and the Bible says that they went straight down into Sheol. Um, obviously, that wasn't a good place for them. Right? So it just means they went straight into the afterlife um, or to this place for, for souls. All right. So that's Sheol. There's a word similar to that in the New Testament in the Greek, and that's Hades. Hades is a word that, that's used mostly re, um, is translated as hell, but is, it just means the afterlife. Um, as a matter of fact, Jesus, when he died, the Bible says, um, thou wilt not leave his soul in hell, and in the New Testament that's translated, thou wilt not leave his soul in Hades. Now, did Jesus go to hell when he died and burn in fire? No. Remember he told the, the man on the cross, he said, uh, today you will be with me in paradise, right? Not, not, not in hell. But that's all in the same area of this afterlife, um, this place where the souls go, um, even though he wasn't in the tormenting part of it, okay? So, so those words are sort of generic words, but a more, more specific words, uh, terms that are used for hell is this one phrase in the New Testament, and that is the phrase Gehenna. Most of the times um, that, that it's used, as a matter of fact, um, Gehenna is used 12 times in the New Testament versus Hades 10 times in Tartaru once. So most of the times that you see the word hell translated in the New Testament, most of those times it's coming from the word Gehenna. Now Gehenna was a valley um, outside of Jerusalem, um, and, and it was in Israel. And basically this valley used to be a place where they would actually sacrifice little children to false gods. I mean, terrible, terrible things. And God said, I'm going to judge those evil, evil people who are sacrificing their children to false gods, and I'm going to burn them. Like, the, the pronunciation of judgment on them was that they were also going to be burned. And so that valley where this took place became sort of the picture of, the, of hell, this tormenting place where God judges those who are evil and wicked, right? And that's Gehenna. So some people say, well, it was a trash pit where they burned their trash. There's not really a lot of evidence that I've been able to find to say that that's actually true, even though it's something a lot of people say. Um, but it, it was, at least we can say that it was this place that in the Jewish mind was 
associated with the judgment of God and fire, and that's why they use that valley as a picture of what happens after you die and you face the judgment of God. So we can say this then, that hell, based on the words that are used for it, is at least a place where God judges people for their sins. Now, remember that, you know, everyone deserves to be judged by God for their sins. The Bible says, for all have come short of the glory of God, we're all sinners, right? Ezekiel said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We all deserve, because we've all sinned, death of our souls. So it's not that, you know, um, some people deserve hell and other people deserve heaven, right? The, um, the fact of the matter is we all deserve hell. But the question is, who receives hell? Who receives the judgment of God and who escapes it, right? And, of course, the answer is those who come to Christ and submit to him by faith— um, and turn to him as their Lord and Savior. All right? So then we have this at least. We've established now that hell is a place where God's judgment is poured out on people. Um, and there's also a, two other phrases used for hell, okay? We've talked about four of them so far. Tartaru, Hades, Gehenna, and Sheol. Sheol being the Old Testament word, Tartaru, Gehenna, and Hades being the New Testament words. But there's two more words that are used for it, and that is... Um, this idea of it being a pit or an abyss. Some, some people will translate it bottomless pit. That's how it's translated in, in the English Bible. Um, and it, it comes from the, if you look at Luke 8.31 or Re, all the places in Re, Revelation where it talks about the bottomless pit, it's translated from a Greek word just abyss. Well, the Greek word is abyssan, abyssan, from which we get the word abyss. It's just this empty place, it's an abyss, and that's why they translated it bottomless pit. Um, and we know, we do think it's, it makes sense to call it bottomless pit because in Isaiah 14, 15, it's called exactly that, it's called a pit. Um, in Isaiah 14, 15, we'll go to this one, um, you see a description of Satan. Again, remember that hell was created for Satan so that God could pour out his judgment on Satan for rebelling against him, right? Uh, when humans also rebelled, they also condemned themselves for this, to the same fate. But that's not the purpose of hell originally. And, of course, that's why Jesus came and died on the cross, to save humans from hell, all right? Um, but that is where we'll go if we don't repent and accept Christ as, as Lord. Um, now, uh, Isaiah 14 and verse 15 says this, talking about Satan, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So here hell, that, that's the word sheol, is referred to as a pit. Uh, this abyss that is a, a, just like a bottomless pit. Okay, um, Numbers also tells us of the story of Korah. It says they went down into Sheol, which means it, it, makes, it makes this idea that they went right down into the pit. Actually, it's translated in most Bibles as they went down into the pit, um, Sheol. And then in Luke chapter 8, we have this other use of the word um, abyss um, to, to describe this. Eight, Luke chapter 8, verse 31, it says, and they besought him that uh, these are the demons that Jesus is going to cast out of this man. And the demons are begging Jesus. It says they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss or, or the deep, which is really the bottomless pit. The same thing translated bottomless pit in, in the book of Revelation. So they're, they're begging Jesus, please don't send us into this place of, of torment. Um, so it's clear then that that hell was created for the devil and for his angels, for the demons. It wasn't created originally for, for humans, but humans go there. We see all the way back in the book of Numbers that Korah, when they rebelled against God, um, that, that the earth opened, swallowed them up, sent them right there, uh, the same place. And so God does judge humans the same way that he judges angels, but that's the place that hell is. So it is a place of torment. It is a place of, of God's judgment. Okay? So, but now the question then re, it remains, though, is it eternal torment? Is it forever 
And are people conscious for it, or do they just experience it for a moment and then boom, they're gone, their souls are gone, and and uh, and they don't actually experience it the rest of eternity? That's a big question, because it would make us feel a lot better about people who refuse to accept Christ as their Savior if we could know at least that when they die, there's pain and then they're gone, rather than there's pain forever and ever and ever in this place of torment. But before we even look at the scriptures that, that prove that this is actually an eternal conscious torment and a, something that is at least very similar to flames, if it's not actual flames and fire, um, I want you to just back up to the study that we've already done. Remember that these dead are raised from the dead in order to face judgment and then to be cast into hell, right? So if the dead have to be raised first, that means they're given new bodies just to be cast into hell, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if their bodies are just gone, right? Why weren't they just left dead and you know, out of existence? Why are they raised again to, to, to suffer this judgment if it's just an instant of judgment and boom, they they're disappear and they're gone? It doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? And it also doesn't fit with the scripture. Okay, let me show you a couple of verses. We'll go um, first to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, and this is paralleled in the book of Matthew. Chapter 18. Mark chapter 9, verse 42, says this, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, I cut it off, for it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It seems that word worm seems to be talking about the body of a person that goes there. Their body never dies, but they're continually um, experiencing this fire. Verse 45, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Jesus is using an extreme scenario, right? If your foot makes you sin, which nobody can blame your foot if your foot, if you sin, right? You can't say, it was my foot's fault. It was, right? Um, or if your eye offends you, right? You know, and people do sin with their eyes, but it's not their eye's fault that they sin, right? You can pluck your eyes out, and Jesus said, adultery is in your heart, you can still lust, right? And so your eye didn't cause the, the lust. But if it were that simple, and it were just your eye, then you'd want to pluck that out right away, because that would keep you from hell, right? But the point that Jesus has already made before he's making this point about avoiding hell is that your sin is deep within you. It's not just the actions that you, that you participate in. It's actually who you are, your desires. You desire wrong things, right? I mean, even though we say, no, I'm not going to do that, we still have that desire. And often we can entertain those desires and say, well, as long as I don't actually say anything to that person, I can think that way about them, right? As long as, as, long as I don't act on it, right, I can just enjoy this indulgence in, in my mind. But Jesus makes it very clear in the Sermon on the Mount that if you hate a brother, it's just, you might as well have just murdered them. If you lust after a woman, you might as well have committed adultery with them. Because as far as the standards of God are, God are concerned, it's already done. Sin in your heart is sin. And so Jesus is saying, you see, it's your heart that causes you to sin. You can't plug out your heart. But if it were as simple as your eyes, you'd just want to go ahead and pluck those out because you don't want to go to hell. But we're all sinners by nature, and we're all headed to hell. So, but, but he's saying, this is how serious it is. Because you're headed to eternity in this place. And so he's not giving the answer yet. He's leaving the answer open-ended, right? So how do we get saved? How, you know, of course, it's 
because Jesus is going to suffer that penalty for you on the cross, and then you trust in him, and you let that payment for, for your sin that you owe for your sin be applied to you, so now you can go to heaven, right? So he's not answering that in this, in this statement, though. He's just pointing out that this is how serious it is, because if you don't, hell, this is what really happens. People really go to hell, and it really is forever. It says, never the fire that will never be quenched. Verse 45, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter and halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. And if the eye offend, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The idea here that Jesus is explaining is it's not just serious because it's, it's a second death. It's serious because it's eternal death. It's eternity in this place of fire. I mean, that's a, you know, this is why this, he's, he's, he's saying this is why this is so important. You read the same thing in, uh, in Matthew 18 uh, where uh, the, the same... Uh, the same passage is, is uh, also used. I'm not going to, uh, I'm just looking at it right now to see if there's anything. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let that go because I don't want to, I don't want to just rehash what we had in, in Mark 9, which is, it's basically the same, but it's, it's the same concepts. In Matthew, um, in Matthew you have, um, in Mark 9 you have that word Gehenna being used. That's the word used in Mark 9. This is the judgment of God into hell where there is fire that won't be quenched. So what we're getting here is that there is this, at least either there is actual fire or there's something that is just as bad that the best thing Jesus could use to describe it is fire. It's that tormentous, it's that painful. And so the best thing he could use to describe it was fire. But it sounds to me like it's actual fire, right? Um, and and we can we can confirm that I think with the book of Revelation. So let's go now to the book of Revelation. I think this is a great place to go um, to kind of get the conclusion. I've sort of stayed away from it so far, but in the book of Revelation we have this abyss that's referred to, and uh, it's referred to in Revelation fourteen eleven. But we'll come back to Revelation fourteen eleven. First, I want you to go to Revelation 20. In Revelation 19, when Jesus returns, there's a ruler on the earth that we like to call the Antichrist, but Revelation calls him the beast. It just calls him the beast. And he has a guy who's helping him called, that Revelation calls the false prophet. So there's two people who are just really evil on the earth that Jesus comes back and he defeats them. And when he returns in the future... Um, They are taken, both these two, the beast and the false prophet, are thrown into a place called uh, Limnen to Pyros. That's a terrible pronunciation of the Greek, which just means um, the lake of fire. The lake of fire. Um, That is in uh, Revelation 19, verse 20. Then you have in Revelation 20... You have Satan being cast into a different place called the bottomless pit or the abyss. Uh, I saw an angel come down from heaven having a key to the abyss or the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit or the abyss and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So God locks up the devil, and for the next thousand years, Jesus actually reigns as the king of the whole earth. Boy, that's going to be nice, right? You know, you think about how, man, if only we had the right guy in government, how much better things could be. Well, imagine if Jesus was in charge of all of the government of the world. I think that would be an amazing place. And it will be. It will be. Um, so, and then, so, but, but Satan is also locked up, all right, for, for that thousand years. And he is locked in a place called the abyss, the bottomless pit. The same thing we've already heard described of hell, um, which we know is a fiery place. Now, look at what it says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. Uh, 
Um, actually, we can go to um, Revelation 20, verse 10 first. When, when the devil finally gets out of the bottomless pit, he goes around, he deceives people again, and attacks Christ again, which is, of course, not going to work, and, and he's defeated. When the devil's finally defeated in chapter 20, verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived the nation, them was cast into, now he's cast into that lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. So the beast... Who's a, who's a guy, he's this evil guy, and the false prophet, he's a human, who is an evil man, that when Jesus returns, and the devil are tormented day and night forever in this place, which means they don't just go there and disappear, right? This is eternal, conscious torment in the lake of fire. Then it says that, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Uh, this is the fact that every human being is going to stand before God someday. And it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is, in the, book, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the, according to their works. In the books according to their works. So there's a book in heaven that has recorded everything that I've ever done. It says all the books are opened, and all the people are resurrected. And then there's another book called the book of life and basically the idea is you come before the great white throne the book of life is opened they find your name oh you don't belong here you're excused right but the book of life is opened and they don't find your name then they open the book that has all of your deeds that you've ever done and okay let's see if you deserve heaven Ah, here's a sin that's all we need i'm sorry you're in the lake of fire, right? This is, this is how serious it is, right? Because it is a matter of, is my name in the book of life? And if not, boom, I'm in hell. And that's what it says. Um, the sea, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell gave up, delivered up the dead which were in them. So now every soul that is already in hell, notice that. So souls are in hell before they're sent into this new place called the lake of fire, which means that yes, there's a hell right now when we die, if, if, we're not, if we're not believers, if our names aren't in the book of life. But then also, when we're resurrected, then we go on into eternal judgment. So hell is sort of like a, uh, like a, a waiting place, sort of like jail, right? Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been to jail. Please don't raise your hand if you have. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you get arrested. Before you go on trial, you go to jail, Right? Then after you go to trial, then you're going to be put, if you're convicted, you get put in prison, right? So this place here um, that's referred to as hell or, or Gehenna, that is like a jail. That's a place, a holding place, until they go to the great white throne judgment. They're judged there, and then, okay, now it's prison. This is where you're spending eternity, right? That's the idea. It says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What that means is that there's no single person who get, who's not written in the book of life who makes it. Like all the books that have all the deeds that everyone's ever done, they look through all the books and no one makes it based on the books. No one makes it based on their works. <laughs> you know, Everyone who's not written in the book of life, who doesn't get the excuse when, they, when their works are judged, they end up in hell. And this is the thing. So many people, I would say the vast, vast majority, even the majority of, of people who call, consider themselves Christians, think that it is their good deeds that's going to get them to heaven. But the fact is, you can possibly get there. Everyone who rests on their good deeds ends up in the lake of fire because it's not good enough. Because one sin is all it takes to deserve eternal judgment. That's what hell was created for. The devil and his angels who sinned against God. No, we can't do good to outweigh our sin, right? That would be like a judge casting out a rapist and saying, yeah, you did enough good to, cut, to, take, to make up for that rape, right? No. No, you, you deserve eternity in prison or worse uh, for that. And the same thing goes for us. When we sin against God, we deserve eternity in the lake of fire. But Jesus, in love for us, suffered the penalty for us. 
So that penalty still has to be paid, but Jesus paid it for us. And all we do is say, in faith, I turn to Christ, I accept him, and I submit to him as Lord. Boom, that's it. Now we can go to heaven, right? So now our name's in the book of life, and we get excused from this judgment, right? But here, it makes it pretty clear. And someone says, well, you don't know. Maybe it's just the, the beast and the false prophet and Satan that are eternal, and all the rest are just going to hell, and then they're annihilated. All right, well, if that's what, the way you think, back up to Revelation 14. And I told you we'd go there. We'll end here in Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 11 Um, there's a prophecy of this final judgment that's going to come. This is during all the things that happen right in the end times, right before Jesus returns. And there's prophecy comes out about, hey, get ready, because the final judgment's going to come in the end. And verse, we'll back up to verse 10. The same, um, well, let's, let's back up to verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast... So if you, the, the Antichrist is demanding that people worship him, saying that he's God. If anyone worships him and his image and receives his mark in their forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and receive his image and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. What they're saying is at this judgment, when everyone goes into that lake of fire, they're specifically talking about the sinners who worship this false god, Um, but they say, here's the thing, you're going to be part with everyone else who's going to burn in that lake of fire forever and ever. There's no respite there is no peace. It is eternal, conscious torment. Now, I'm willing to consider the idea that it's not actual fire, but if it's not actual fire, and that's just a, that's just a figurative of something else, then imagine how bad that other thing is, you know, that it had to be figured by fire that is about the most painful thing that you can ever experience, right? Being burned is extremely painful. You know, not too long ago, um, actually, at Christmas time, I was pouring my. It was no, it was Thanksgiving time. I was making tea at my at my mother's house, and she has this old teapot, right? I I got like the new electric one where I can just you know I just pour, you know it just boils everything. It's all safe and all that stuff. Well, hers it's got this little top on it, and it gets really hot, and it doesn't just shut itself off like mine. So it's just bubbling, bubbling hotter and hotter while it's whistling. I get over, I finally turn it off. And the top wasn't secure on it all the way. So I poured it, I was pouring the tea and the top came off. And the steam, just the steam from that water hitting my fingers was one of the most painful things I have ever experienced. It was extremely painful. And I had welts and, and it, it was a serious burn just from steam. And you can imagine the lake of fire and brimstone, the amount of pain that this is a constant experience. You know, there's a popular, well, I don't know if it's still popular, but years ago it was popular, um, a group called, uh, I think it was ACDC, who wrote, they were on a highway to hell, that hell ain't a bad place to be. Um, And, you know, it was all just, rock and roll is all about rebelling against the standard norms and everything, and they were trying to rebel against another norm, um, Christianity, but... In fact, they had no idea what they were saying. Because the reality is, hell is the worst place to be. Matter of fact, someone who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, this, they often say, well, it's like hell on earth, you know? But this earth is as good as it gets for you. Enjoy it while you have it, you know? But for those of us who know Jesus as our Savior, and our names are written in the book of life, right? This earth is as bad as it gets for us. And we have heaven waiting for us, you know? This is as close to hell as we'll get. But for an unbeliever, this is as close to heaven as they'll get. Unless they turn by faith and accept Christ. This is why the gospel is so important, right? This is why salvation must be emphasized and expressed to everyone. Everyone needs to make a choice about Jesus, you know? Um, 
what, why are we having, why are we doing the, the starting a youth ministry? So that we can get one-on-one with teenagers and talk to them about what they're going to do with Jesus. Are you, going to, are you going to accept Jesus as your Savior? Because we don't want people going to this place, right? This is eternal conscious torment. This is not good. This is not something, by the way, this is why probably one of the worst, and I know it's one of the least used, it, um, it's considered not that bad of a curse word anymore, the word hell, right? I think it's one of the worst words that we can use flippantly. As Christians, we know hell is a real place. How, how dare we, um, as Christians, ever use that word as if it's just something to laugh about, right? No. Um, if, if we have any sort of heart of Jesus Christ at all, our heart is not to make little of this matter or to try to imagine it away, but rather say, this is a real place, and just like Jesus doesn't want people going there, we don't want people going there either, and live our lives to help get the gospel to people so they can be saved.